Um, he's our he is our featured speaker for this evening. He is also currently the editor in chief at the National Constitution Center, but he's also a journalist, a historian, and a digital media executive. Recently, he published several articles about Pearl S. Buck's legacy, um, in particular, her support of civil rights, desegregation, and equality. And so that's what brings Mr. Von Boy to us tonight. He first reached out to me some time ago, hoping to research about her impact on the local community in Bucks County. But his research and interest quickly developed to include a new project, this project, focusing on Mrs. Buck's activism and the civil rights movement. Well, Pearl S. Buck is known for her popular works like The Good Earth, Mr. Bomboy realized that her advocacy work was just as essential to understanding and reflecting on her continuing legacy today. He also realized that the nature of her lost civil rights speech, which we'll learn about tonight, provides a fascinating window into her legacy, not just for the staff of Pearl S. Buck International, but for the public as well. Many of the issues that Mrs. Buck fought for in her lifetime remain very relevant to our lives today. We hope that you'll join us for a Q&A after Mr. Bomboy's presentation and in breakout rooms following that, where we will continue the conversation. I would ask that if you have any questions during the presentation that you please send them to the chat. I will put them all together and I will ask them during the Q&A following the presentation. With that being said, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Scott. Thank you. So, uh... I'm honored to be speaking uh, virtually for uh, the Pearl Buck International. And the way I got into this topic is some of you, the, the Perkisians in the audience know I wrote a book last year about the history of Perkisi up until 1945. And I originally had written that book to end in 1959. And I talked to a friend of mine, Dick Shearer, who was the longtime editor of the Reporter in Lansdale. And he said, you should really stop in 1945 and start interviewing people about Perkisi in the 50s and 60s. So I started the research uh, pro buck because when you go through the online copies of the, the, the uh, news hurl from Perkisie, she would pop up occasionally. And I came across this story in 1951 where she was invited to speak at Cardozo High School in Washington, D.C. And that was an all, it was a segregated school, it was an all black school, had recently been all white school. And she was disinvited by the Washington, D.C. school district. And they said it was because she did not clear a check about being a communist. And she said, no, that's not correct. It's because I'm really opposed to segregation and DC was a segregated school district. So I did my research on the controversy and, and it was a controversy nationally for a couple of months. And I started going backwards to figure out what her civil rights record was. And there was a lot of interesting stuff, especially from the thirties and forties where I didn't see in other sources. So it's mentioned occasionally, but she was in the newspaper a lot. She wrote frequently and she was just a very, very public figure. And she was one of the early advocates for civil rights in the thirties being a basically a white celebrity. Her and Eleanor Roosevelt were the two most public people who were champions of the equality clause at a time when it was not the, maybe the most popular thing to do. So this became like a three month project for me because the good thing about Pearl Buck is, and the bad thing is there's a lot of information about her out there. And the, you know, Pearl Buck International has their own archives. There's research, there's like several biographies, uh, but there's just so much on the internet now about her. It took me a long time to pin down what the story was. And what I wound up doing, I used the same technique I used for my Percocy book where I read a lot of newspapers and there are a lot of newspapers available online. There's four or five different ways you can get them through uh, newspapers.com, Chronically in America, which is a free resource from the government and uh, Genealogy Bank, Newspaper Archive. And the problem with it is she was in the newspaper every day for like 35 years. It's incredible the amount of coverage she generated from being an author and being a public figure and being Pearl Buck basically. So I really got to the point about a month ago where I was pretty confident with the research and we talked about doing a physical event for this and it didn't work out with the COVID situation. So what I'm gonna do is run through a pretty brief PowerPoint deck. It has about 30 slides. It should take about 15 to 20 minutes. 
and then we can do the Q and A and maybe go into some details about some of the slides about her real interesting. She had a very, very active career in that area before Welcome House. And to me, the one, two things I learned about Pearl Buck is it's hard for us to conceptualize about how famous she actually was in her lifetime, especially in the thirties and forties, she was an international figure. And uh, the Welcome House is really kind of the, when she gets to that point in 48 and 49, she and her husband, that is kind of like a dividing line in her legacy publicly because I know her from Welcome House. I didn't know a lot about her, her legacy in the civil rights. I think a lot of people here who are friends or family or grew up in the area, they know about Welcome House. They're not really, you know, things about what she did in the 30s and 40s during the war aren't talked about that much, but I think they're very important to understand. So what I'm gonna do, if I can do this correctly, is share my PowerPoint and get that full screen. And can everybody see that? Thumbs up. Thank you. And really, she was uh, always involved, from what I can tell from the primary sources, in a lot of social causes. And she was a very early supporter of civil rights in the United States. And a part of that is because uh, of her background in China. As I think as some of us know, she grew up in China. Uh, she was here for college for four years. I think she did a year at Cornell to get her master's degree. But until she was about 40 years old, she spent most of her adult life in China in her childhood. And she kind of had what she called a bifocal view of um, her personality as being Chinese and American. And she came back uh, to the uh, US really to, 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 to reap the benefits of writing a good earth. She grew up in China, her parents were missionaries. Uh, she went to, she was basically homeschooled. I think she did a year, maybe some kind of instructional program there. Went to Randolph-Macon University in Virginia, got her, her bachelor's degree, went back to China. She got married to John Lossingbuck, who was an agricultural economist. She started, she had written as a child, but she actually had a writing career in China before she came to the US. Her second book was submitted to John Day Publishing, The Good Earth, and The Good Earth was the best-selling book in five years in 1932. In fact, it was the best-selling book in the year 1931 and 1932 in the U.S. So she went from really being someone who was almost anonymous to being a celebrity relatively quickly. And that is an important part of her career because that gave her status in the 30s to talk about some of the social issues that were uncomfortable to some people, but she felt was really, really important. And this is what I just talked about. One, one of the interesting things about her life, one of the key moments was she was teaching in Nanking at a, a university that was sponsored by the Presbyterians because her family were Presbyterians and the parents were uh, missionaries. And at that point, there was a fight between the warlords in the area and there was a joint military force Part of it was Chiang Kai-shek, part of it was Mao and the communists. And the communists did, basically came into Nanking, they rioted, they killed foreigners. There was, there, was, there was an incident and she had to hide for several days with her family to avoid being killed because of she was, she was you know, a European. And that made a big impact on her uh, viewpoint about civil rights basically. And she came back to the US she was accepted as being this kind of novel celebrity. And she was a really early advocate for civil rights. And she uh, basically uh, became an early supporter of the National Urban League. And the National Urban League and the NAACP were the groups in the 30s that advocated for you know, equality for, for, for Blacks, basically. She joined their board in 1935. She went to a tea in Harlem in 1933 before she went back to China. And she spoke for about an hour and 15 minutes, kind of off the cuff about her shared experience of being a person who was a minority in a large country. So she emphasized with the equality struggle right away because she lived it on the opposite side in China. And what she did is she, she did a deal with uh, Opportunity Journal, which was the journal for the National Urban League, where she would write two stories a year for about a decade. And these stories were very, very uh, 
either speeches or columns she wrote either from in China or in the US. And she talked about a lot of issues that were not talked about. One of the big controversies in the 1930s in the US were, were the anti-lynching laws. And the anti-lynching laws had their origins, I think 20 years before that, where Congress was trying to put a law in the book to make it a federal crime to be involved in a lynching. And then the feds would actually enforce the uh, law because the Southern states weren't doing it. And she was just totally shocked and appalled that this would happen in this country that she had idealized living in China. And she saw evidence of this when she came back, she went to an art, uh, art display, I believe in, in Harlem, that was art about the lynching problem. And she was very touched by this. And she would write these very uh, detailed, emotional, you know, really strongly written pieces about equality. And they mostly were read by the black audience. And one thing I found in my research is in the thirties, there were basically mainstream newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and they had a very wide readership, but there was a relatively large audience, about 12 million people who were black at that point. They had their own newspapers and the Pittsburgh Courier was the kind of the New York Times of the black newspaper world. They had 200,000 daily subscribers and they would take these things, these essays she wrote for the National Urban League and the NAACP and other people, and they would put it out to this national audience. So she had quite the reputation of, as being a social equality advocate in that community in the 1930s. What really put her on a different level was in 1938 when she was awarded the Nobel Prize for literature. She was the first American woman to have the literature Nobel Prize. She was the third American. I think she was the fourth woman. Within the artistic world, it was controversial because there were some people who did not view her as an outstanding writer. And a lot of it was just basically jealousy because she got it compared to other people. The Nobel Committee gave her the prize because of her efforts to increase understanding between Eastern and Western culture. So it wasn't about one book, it was the body of her work. And in 1938, the, the World War II had really broken out in China and Japan and her work was seen as more almost as a, as a humanitarian work and not a literary work. But this kind of gave her a new stage, a new platform to, to become an activist. Her activism really took off on the eve of World War II. She was very concerned about China, the fact that people did not understand the gravity of the situation between China and Japan. And she made a decision that <clears throat> she was going to start speaking to this mainstream audience. And she read an editorial one day in the New York Times about Harlem. And there was an incident in Harlem where there was a, a young man who was white who was killed in some kind of confrontation with two black youths. And the New York Times did an editorial and they said, on the one hand, we need you know, to increase economic opportunity for blacks, but on the other hand, we need more policing than Harlem. And this set her off and she sent them a 2300 word editorial saying, no, you're wrong. I don't care if, if you're the New York Times, you don't understand the race situation. And there was a major debate about this in November of 1941. One person who defended New York Times was the Broadway columnist for another newspaper, Ed Sullivan. And, and he got beat down because he, it was, it was an interesting debate to say the least, but she kind of earned the respect of the New York Times and they gave her a platform for the next three or four years to, to do a lot of editorials, at least a dozen, that had something to do with social equality and race equality and race prejudice during the war. And this, the New York Times at that point was probably the most powerful newspaper at least in the United States, if, if not the world. So she used that as a platform. This is her letter that she sent, written in Percocet, PA, which is really Dublin, as we know, or Hilltown. So she became this advocate on a broad national stage for equality at a time when it may not have been the most popular thing to do. And also, if you're thinking about her career in 1940, she, 41, she's a best-selling novelist. She's a media personality. She doesn't have to do this to be, you know, famous and successful. She feels obligated to do this for a lot of reasons. Part of it is because of her missionary background, her personal belief system about equality. And she uh, was very active during the war in saying things that may not have been popular, but probably in the long term are correct about 
uh, race relations and other things. And she really not only used the newspapers, she did articles for, for magazines and she found a way to get the message out to a much broader audience than she could in the 1930s where she was targeted on the black owned newspapers and she wasn't getting a lot of coverage in the mainstream press. And these, the editorials are interesting. And at some point she put out two books through John Day Publishing and uh, one was a collection of uh, essays in 42, one was a collection of essays in 1943. And what I'm showing in this slide here is how the black newspapers took a different interpretation of her speeches. She would say something that was very neutral, but depending upon who was viewing the speech, there were different opinions about it. The first book was called American Unity in Asia, and she includes her speech in the New York Times. And she also talks about the treatment of uh, mostly Japanese Americans who were put in internment camps during the war after an executive order from President Roosevelt, mostly on the West Coast. And she, uh, along with the ACLU, were very upset about this for a lot of reasons. They thought it was morally incorrect. They thought it was unconstitutional. Probably not the most popular stance to take at that time period, in early, especially in early 1942 when the war was not going well for, for the Americans. And the book got a lot of coverage. It got kind of mixed reviews. But it, it, again, it's a way for her to get a, a dozen essays out about these topics she's very passionate about. And she has incredible stature as not only as a famous person, but a person who is respected in, in the United States and globally. So these things, um, in my opinion, I think they kind of accumulated. And she kind of started making the argument for ending the very controversial policy of desegregation, desegregation in the military and also uh, discrimination in the civilian workforce that supported the military. The second book she put out is another series of essays. I actually got a copy of this two weeks ago on eBay and read through it. And it, again, it's, they're the same themes that she's talking about. And her main theme is the world will not respect us if we win the war, if we discriminate against people of color. And she does this in different ways. She makes different arguments about it. But to her, the war is more about, it's a truly a global war, but it's also very Asia-centric because she's always thinking about China. But she's saying these people in other countries, it, you know, there has to be a means to the end for fighting World War II. And that is basically the end of discrimination, but also the end of uh, colonial rule by England and France. Not in the most popular things, again, to, to say, but she felt really strongly about what the world would look like after the war. Also in uh, What America Means to Me, she does a series of, uh, they're short essays, short speeches she gave about Jefferson and Lincoln. And you can kind of see the origin of her thought process about equality. She was very big on uh, what we would call natural rights during the time the founders was basically that People, you know, are and it, they have inalienable or unalienable rights that can't be taken away from them from governments. And we all know Jefferson's, you know, sentence in, in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That later would become kind of the mantra for the civil rights movement. But she was very upfront about using this sentence a lot when she, she spoke to groups during the war about the need for equality and for the end of segregation. Again, a really powerful message and she was making this message to a broad audience at this point, not a really narrow audience. The other thing I found in What America Means to Me is there's a short story up front about uh, she goes to Philadelphia. She talks to a young black teenager and her mother to do an interview for the Ladies Home Journal. And she does a Q&A with the daughter and she asks her about different things. And it turns out her father is away because he's serving with the uh, <clears throat> the Tuskegee Airmen and she's at Philadelphia Girls School and she gets into a lot of questions about her perception of what it means to be American as a black young woman in the World War II era and it's a difficult conversation for her to have and she's upset Pearl Buck because she can just see what she calls the, the dark shadow of racism because again it's a highly educated family uh her mother's a teacher, the father's a military doctor. And 
what I found in my research is Penn has the archives of the letters they sent. In this story, in the book, they do not, she doesn't say who the people are, but the young woman, her name was Mary Hinkson, and she was a lead dancer for Arthur Graham after she got out of college. And she has this dialogue in the letters and in, in Penn's archives about how they're going to publish the story. The Ladies Home Journal would not publish the story. They published a lot of her works. They did not want to publish something like that. And she published it anyway in the book because she had a commitment to what she felt was really like telling the truth. Another speech she gave during World War II was at Howard University, which is an all black university in you know, Washington. She was a special guest for an honorary degree and it was Mary McLeod Bethune was the other special guest and she spoke at Howard and she made a little controversial statement where she said, well, we're no better in the fascists if we win the war, if we don't end segregation. So this message was, was, was received in two ways. It was kind of welcome in the black community and some people in the, the mainstream community had mixed feelings about it, but not all the people even in the black community thought her message was strong enough. And um, Gordon Blaine Hancock, who was a syndicated columnist and a civil rights leader was critical. And there were people in the, the black press who were critical but she didn't go far enough for them. But at that point, she was really, along with Eleanor Roosevelt, were only the people on the white side who were saying things. One person who definitely had her attention was J. Edgar Hoover from the FBI. And they uh, started a file on her in 1942 based upon her speech at Howard, uh, the New York Times letter, and I think she did an article in Asia Magazine about the, the need for the end to desegregate the military. And the FBI kept tabs on her for the rest of her life. And some of those files are public, they're redacted. And uh, it's interesting because they really, the FBI was concerned about her comments causing uh, a disruption within the you know, the, the black workforce during the war. And these are the actual notes in the FBI file. You can find these on the FBI archive where they are annotating. They had case reviewers for the FBI and they would go through whatever they would consider the surveillance or the record keeping, a lot of the press clips and they would annotate how they felt about it. So they did not like her core sentence in her letter at the New York Times saying that race prejudice alone is the root of the plight of people in, in Harlem. So they had a really different perception of race because A, maybe they didn't agree with that viewpoint, but also they saw it as potentially disruptive of the war effort. By the end of the war, she is mostly concerned with the state of China. And because she grew up in China and there's the Chinese civil war between the communists and the nationalists. And she does not get as active publicly in the area of civil rights really from, the, from that point in 1946. She does do some appearances, she makes some speeches. She's more concerned about, uh, she's focused on desegregation in Washington, DC and how uh, the, the schools are segregated there. And when she did the interview in 1941 with uh, the family in Philadelphia, what really upset her was the daughter was an honor student her, she went to you know, a desegregated school in Philadelphia. She could not do the class field trip that year because there was no place for her to stay in Washington because she was a, you know, a black teenager and everybody had to stay together. And that kind of just really, I think there's three or four different statements she made publicly in the late forties about, she was really focused on Washington DC. She was just defended with it, that she felt was the capital of the world was segregated and that was just ethically wrong. And she did do a book in 1949 with a, a Slanda Good Robeson, who was uh, Paul Robeson's wife. She was an academic, I believe she's an archeologist. And they had two really different viewpoints on the race issue. And it's an interesting book from different perspectives. It's not about, about race, it's about different issues. And that came out and that also got mixed reviews, but it was really kind of a bold step on her point and her part to kind of keep the issue alive of equality. 
the thing that I said before in the beginning of the presentation is it really is this kind of bright line in her life before and after Welcome House. And for those of you who haven't, I read Dale Yoder's book. It's excellent. That's a really good overview of the uh, how that whole program was created. But she, you know, was contacted by someone who had a biracial child who could not get adopted, and she got involved in the process of helping in her family and her neighbors and friends helping these people. A lot of her efforts really, in my opinion, after 48 and 49, were focused on uh, Welcome House. And also in early 1951, she had published her book about her child, Carol, who, who was born with intellectual disabilities. And her article, ironically, in the Ladies Home Journal was really the first public effort to acknowledge that as an issue that, that needed basically more understanding. So she had these two things going on where Welcome House was front and center. She had her publishing career. She was getting ready to do a book tour about uh, the, the child left, the child who never grew up, the book about her daughter, Carol. And then everything happens with this controversy in Washington. And the interesting thing is the school in Washington, Cardozo High School had been the most magnificent public school in Washington, DC. It was beautiful. It was architecturally built into the side of a hill. So there's a vista and overlooked Washington, DC. The, the two most famous alumni were Helen Hayes, the actress, and that's where J. Edgar Hoover went to high school. And she was invited to speak down there by uh, the assistant principal. And as soon as the, the school district failed out, they quickly disinvited Pearl Buck, which is probably not the smartest thing to do. And then she offered to, uh, have her speech printed out, the commencement speech and handed out to students. They said, no, you're not allowed to have your speech printed out. So she went through a third party organization and the speech appeared in many of the newspapers across the country. And it's, it's a great speech. And uh, I'm not gonna get, I don't think I have a full copy of it here, but she really talks about the state of prejudice in 1950. And then her final sentence in the speech is Jefferson's quotation from the Declaration of Independence about equality. So that's kind of how I got involved with the, the project. Uh, I think her legacy, which is not really understood, is how important she was in the 30s and 40s, especially to groups like the NAACP and the National Urban League and just that whole Black culture where she they had a champion who was a Nobel Prize winner who would stick up for them. And she was a very, very famous person, and she took chances to do what she felt was the right thing, even though she didn't have to. And that's kind of her legacy in the 40s for civil rights. And the last thing I have on the slide is a quotation from, there's a, a rally, I believe in Madison Square Garden in 1942 about equality and Walter White, who was the head of the NAACP said, there's only two people basically in the white community who, who's spoken out for this, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was good friends with Pearl Buck and Pearl Buck herself. And to me, that's kind of her legacy. And uh, it's to me, it's, it's a real interesting project. And again, it, there's this, this bright division between her life before and after Welcome House, which is kind of apparent when you read about all her press coverage. But she had this really important role that's not widely understood today in the role of equality even before 1938 and 1949. So I'm gonna stop sharing at this point. And if, do we want to do a Q&A now or any kind of follow? Sure. I have some questions. And if anybody who is in our audience has questions, um, if you could please send them to the chat, just because there are so many of us, if we have many people muting, unmuting, um, it could get a little bit difficult um, to get everybody's questions. So if you're able to please send those questions to the chat. Um, but if if not, um, I have some things that I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in following up on a little bit with you, Scott. Um, so in, in your presentation, you talk about how Pearl Buck was writing to really two different audiences in, in many ways, or at least her work was being consumed by, by two different audiences. And I was just interested in your perspective on how her, her advocacy and her work impacted the civil rights movement um, between, between those two groups. So 
the Black community and Black publications, which were sometimes critical of her, but also amenable to the ideas that she was talking about. Um, and then kind of the more white um, mainstream um, society as well, which may have taken a little bit more um, of a, a little bit different approach. And just your perspective on, on how her work impacted the civil rights movement in regards to those two kind of de disparate communities. You know, one of the things I struggled with was looking at that is, did she not actively try to get that message into the mainstream press in the 30s? Or was it the fact that the mainstream press had no interest? And I did find some articles where newspapers that were in the mainstream press talked about some of the issues and statements she made and uh, for the NAACP and the National Urban League and different stories. I think she was really smart as a communicator and she knew where to get the message heard and how to deliver it because that's she did constantly she wrote constantly and she did radio appearances she wrote books she you know she was a, if we had social media back then she would have been you know had 20 million followers and would have been all over the place so she was a smart communicator and at some point in 1940 and 1941 she realized that she had to approach a broader audience and what I found was interesting going through the newspaper research is she kind of did a test speech on that in Doylestown about two months before she wrote the uh, letter to the New York Times. But she, there was a group called the Seroptimists, and she, there was an Atlantic Coast meeting in Doylestown, and she kind of said the same thing publicly at a meeting there. At that point, she had reached a decision where she was going to just, you know, go all in on this messaging, regard, regardless of the price of doing it, because it was the right thing to do. Sure, and so in in working with or approaching different communities who are either involved with the civil rights movement or um, interested or even potentially opposed to it, um, do you think that she took you know a, a kind of a significant significantly different approach in terms of how she would speak to them or approach them. I mean, one of the things that she did to try and get young, um, in particular white men into the civil rights movement was working to create a comic book character. Um, so do you, do you think you could talk um, a little bit about um, her, her kind of unique approach? Well, I think her approach usually was she talked about her experience in China. And uh, when she grew up in China, she was, you know, she was the minority. Her family was the minority and she kind of could empathize with groups and you know I found some articles in the 40s where she would she went to Los Angeles and talked about a group of 200 black teenagers and she said hey this is the way it is you know you need to have faith that discrimination is going to end in our lifetime but you have to say something about it and she would tell her the message to the audience she uh, did a lot of work with Eleanor Roosevelt about stuff. She also would uh, at work with other people. She uh, was highly respected in that community. And I think she definitely had some kind of, whether you can measure the impact she had or not on the civil rights movement in the 50s or 60s. One thing I did talk about in an editorial that I put out in the Herald and the Intel is how she uh, received a book in the mail in 1958 from this young minister down south about the Montgomery boy you know, boycott, it was Martin Luther King. And he certainly knew about her. And, she, and he eventually served on her board of directors for Welcome House. She was held in very high esteem in that community for being an early advocate for a long time. And I think that is her impact that that group of people who eventually became like the, the group of six and did everything in, in the 50s and 60s, they all knew about her. And there was at least some kind of support system outside of their support system that helped that movement go forward. We have a question from Joe in, in the chat. Um, and he is wondering if the different sources that you use to learn about her involvement with the civil rights movement, um, whether that's the newspaper articles, books, other sources, are those publicly available? Yes, what, what, I, what I would usually do, is a historian, you do like a literature review, and what you try to do is you put yourself in the place of people in that time period and like going back in the time machine and trying to think about what society was like in the 30s and 40s. What I do is I use a, 
newspapers.com, Newspaper Archive, Chronicling America. I got a subscription to the New York Times archives. And you always go to the primary sources first because you have assumptions about things, but until you actually see how people debated issues and help handle different things. So those things are available for free. There's also the Internet Archive, which is this repository of this millions of documents that have been scanned. I use that a lot because they have like a magazine articles from the 30s and 40s and different things you, you normally would be hard to find without physically going into a library. And they're valuable because they have different viewpoints and her writings and things like that. So one thing that I, I found really fascinating from, from your presentation, um, do, you, do you get the feeling from, from your research that um, Ms. Buck kind of courted controversy with some of the, the statements that she made, um, in particular kind of ending um, on the Thomas Jefferson quote, um, him, himself a, a figure with kind of a complicated historical legacy. Um, do, do you think that she was trying to stir up controversy, to stir up conversation? Do you have any feel on, on what her motivation for, for, that sort of, um, for that sort of reference might be? I think she was interested in having the debate and she didn't really particularly care if it was controversial or not because it was morally justified. And you have to remember that you know, she grew up in a missionary background and she had strong ideas about right and wrong. And, but she was a smart communicator and she knew there was a right time to do it and a wrong time to do it. But that, that comes through time and again, if you read the logic and the, the kind of the polemics of how she makes arguments in these essays, she'll, you'll, she'll get people to agree on points we all agree upon, what is right and what is wrong, and then what can we do about it? So I think it's a valuable lesson on how to approach problems in general in life, but she was very advanced in her thinking like that. In, in Washington, D.C., when her, her speech was essentially, she was banned from, from speaking to the students, there was such a strong media backlash, there was such a strong backlash um, in parts of the community. Why do you think that reaction was so vivid um, and, and so visceral at that point? Well, I think there's a big factor that maybe we don't recall today is the impact of World War II on culture. And uh, there's definitely an issue on perception of race before and after World War II because of the importance of the black community in the war effort. And uh, definitely in 1950, it's a lot different in 1940 where the majority of people were not happy that, about segregation in general, they saw the need for this thing coming where the civil rights movement was gonna come. But really the war effort was critical in, in, in 1948 when President Truman uh, did the executive order to end segregation in the military. That was hugely controversial, but it was also very important for our society to go forward. And I think that's an example of how the perception of race changed after the war. Before the war, those things would not have happened. And I think uh, that's something that's, that you know, we were taught that in history class. I don't think we understand the true magnitude of that today. Do you think that her, her publications, um, specifically her letter to the New York Times, um, do you think that that kind of shaped the conversation that was happening um, and and if so, how did that kind of take it to a different level? Um, did she reach more people? Did she bring it into the mainstream? What, what do you think was the impact of I think writing? The impact is I read a lot of the uh, coverage in the Black press about her during the war, and that speech is constantly mentioned. It's kind of like a, a key moment in this broadening the, the, the debate about race. And it was the New York Times, it was a month before Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, Senator Arthur Capper in Kansas actually read the speech in the congressional record when they were debating segregation in the military. So that was a pretty significant event in that whole debate where it was taken on the national stage and she was saying things that were controversial that may not have been in the opinion of some people in the best interest of the war effort, but it was, she felt it was a discussion that had to be had because in her mind, you know, the means to the end of the war is just not winning the war, it's making sure we have a better world from that process. So I, I think that that was a key moment that, again, 
it's not widely talked about today, but it's something that should be. I have a question from Pastor Cray or Cree. Cray. Do you, Cray. Um, do you think her writings about racial inequalities would be controversial in our local school boards today? Um, do you think that would also make the New York Times? Oh, that's a good question. It depends on the school board, obviously, but no, I don't think so. I think maybe the question is, is it something that should be discussed in civics class? And I think it'd be a great topic in civics class because you would have to put students in the mindset of the people for and against the argument. And a lot of civics and education in general is understanding different viewpoints. But then again, you know, her speech was about desegregation of the military, uh, equality in the, the workforce, civilian workforce in the military, and really the war goals ensuring that people of all colors are over the world are treated equally. So I, I think it would be an interesting thing to bring into, especially the AP curriculum, but I think it would be a good thing to discuss. So in terms of some of the, the opposition that she faced at, at the time, whether it was people who were critical of her or critiqued her, her opinions or, or things like the, the FBI file on her. Do you think that facing that kind of opposition from what you've seen in your research, do you think that impacted her in such a way that she wanted, she wanted to fight back harder? Um, do you kind of see her as taking that as, as a challenge or if not, how do you think that? impacted her her ability to talk about um, these issues? Well, I don't think she had knowledge that, that the FBI thing or particularly cared because I think she felt morally it's something she had to do as this part of her mission in life, you know? So no, I don't think she would have backed down from a controversy. I don't think she would started a lot of controversies and, uh, but she was, you know, very, you can tell in her writings that she had certain things she thought were right and, and they were wrong. And uh, she was very focused again on China and how people didn't understand Chinese culture, but a bigger problem of people not understanding other cultures. So, but no, I don't think she would have been intimidated at all. And I think we have one, oh, we actually might have a couple more questions. Um, so I will, I will get to these. Um, did you find any evidence that Pearl Buck um, influenced people in her time um, who actually had um, the, the power to do things about racial prejudice? Um, for example, Harry Truman potentially being influenced by her when he desegregated the military. I think Truman, uh... His claim to fame during the war is he, his job, and I believe in the Senate, was to, to really track military spending. And uh, he was very closely tracking the military. Truman, among other people, really, you know, he was not racially of the mind in the 30s, being from Missouri. And his attitude changed during the war because of the impact of the, uh, this, you know, the importance of, of the Black culture and the war effort. I think that, in general, aside from Pearl Buck, probably influenced him. She did influence a lot of people. If you look at her writing, she's a person who wrote constantly, I mean, constantly to people and there's letters all over the place and she constantly lobbied Eleanor Roosevelt and other people. And she understood uh, how to communicate and to do things behind the scenes and in addition to doing it publicly. So I think I said, I think the answer is yes, but I don't, I don't think Truman was directly influenced by her. But the ACLU, there, there were a lot of people who supported the effort to desegregate the military based upon the honorable service of people in the war. Angela says that she interprets Pearl S. Buck to be something of a force to be reckoned with. Do you think her activism started after her success as an author? Um, do you think that it gave her a bigger platform? Do you think even if she hadn't been famous that she still would have been fighting for these issues? Yes, I think she was, uh, again, going back to her childhood in China, being raised as you know the children of missionaries. I think that's an important part of her personality, having a sense of right and wrong. And uh, there are a lot of things she witnessed in China that were not pleasant in her life, and she learned lessons from that. And I think the advantage she had is she was 
bicultural, where she grew up in China, went to the U.S., she could see commonality of certain problems between cultures. Now, she's the kind of person who always, always would have been an activist, I think. She would not have taken a back seat. And kind of to continue that question, we have a, a question um, from Joe and a couple more coming in as well, it looks like. What do you think Pearl S. Buck might be thinking um, and advocating for um, if she had lived to witness um, the civil rights movement within the past 80 years um, from the 40s on, on to the present? Well, she uh, did do occasional statements and speeches about civil rights until she passed away. I know she did an event out in California in the late 1960s about Vietnam, which is really interesting. She definitely had a different perspective in Vietnam. I think she was a big believer in uh, equality and rights, and she would speak out against anything that was really, really count, counter to that. So there, there are things you could think about today she would have opinions about. It's kind of subjective because of the difference in time periods. But she was strongly, strongly morally convinced there was a right and wrong thing to do. And the right thing was, was the whole concept of equality. And that was really kind of a core value that defined her as a person. We've got a few questions, it looks like, related to her FBI file. Um, the first was, was there any indication that she realized that she was under investigation? Um, and then as well um, from, from Anna, our, our CEO of Pearl Asbuck International, was there any indication that her, her life was ever threatened um, or in danger in some way from people who opposed her? I would say no and no, probably. I don't think the, uh, the communists liked her too much in China. <laughs> she was really anti-communist, but I don't think, you know, mm -hmm. she, was, she wouldn't be a prime target. I think she wouldn't have cared anyway because she was so morally vested in you know, the, the, the issues. Mm -hmm. J. Edgar Hoover did write to her directly telling her that he liked the values in some of her work, um, probably as a ploy to try and get her to write back and respond. But that doesn't necessarily indicate that she knew kind of what was, what was going on with that. No, he wrote to her because she wrote up short story about kidnapping in 1938 and they wanted to pick her brain about psychology the kidnapper in the late 40s she wanted to talk to Hoover about uh, it was it, I think it was a uh, something related to China or segregation and he blew her off and he sent a letter to Clyde Tolson who worked for Hoover and he sent Tolson sent it to somebody else named McGuire I believe who talked to her and called her but they uh they were worried about her. They had a nickname for people who were liberals. They called them Pearl Bucks. And that's in the, that's in the, the file. And they were concerned about the demoralization of, of the war effort and just didn't agree with some of the things she said. Right, it looks like we have one last question um, and then we might move to the breakout rooms. Um, have you found any references from your research about her opinions um, in, in terms of the Vietnam War. I haven't gotten there yet. I just found that article today and it's interesting. I forget the name of this column. She was out in California. And it's interesting because she's there, it's a college and then there's, there are people in the audience is gawking at her because she's a celebrity and they've read all her stuff and everything. And she went down the list of uh, how everybody was wrong <laughs> in Vietnam where she was very pressing it was about Korea in China. And she took criticism at the beginning of the Korean War because she did an interview with the press in Japan and said, this is not going to work because the Americans don't understand the culture in Korea and China. And one of her off and on again friends was Dorothy Thompson, who was a very famous columnist, who was also very controversial. And she uh, confronted her in public and said, Pearl Buck, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about, which is probably the last thing you want to do because Pearl Buck responded to her publicly and said, this is what's gonna happen in Korea. And about half a year later, Dorothy wrote her and apologized saying, you're right, I was wrong. And she understood the dynamic in Asia and she was very vocal about how if the Americans didn't do the right thing, it would be a steep price for, 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 for 
you know, generations about how China was going to be handled. And that whole thing with Indochina and China is, is part of that discussion. All right, one last question before we go to the to the breakout rooms. I think it's a very good um, note to kind of keep going, keep the conversation going on. Based upon your research, your extensive research, what was the most striking or did you learn something that you previously weren't familiar with? I knew mostly none of that stuff. I just knew that her association would welcome house and uh... I mean, the good earth, obviously, things like that. I knew she was an activist to a certain extent, but not nearly to the extent. If, when you start going through the primary sources and seeing how active she was, the, the, to me, the, the, the black in the newspapers were fascinating because they really have a different perspective. And she, she would write something that would be a front page story for that audience. That's still, you know, 12 million people. And that's, that's, that's an area I think where historians should look at that conversation more. Uh, the FBI files I knew a little bit about, but I didn't have the context to really interpret them as I do now. But I think the one thing that really impressed me is just how famous she was. I think it's hard for us to understand that she was literally a household name. Her name was in the newspaper every day for like 35 years. And she was a big deal. She, when she said something, she had a lot of respect. And a lot of the reason she did that is because of her her, her literary career, where the, the Good Earth in 1931, when John Day Publishing decided to publish that, they made a deal to have it as the book of them in the Book of the Month Club. And she had a huge grassroots following, just huge. And she could say things that other people couldn't say because of the amount of respect she had in, in the country. And that's something I didn't understand. Wonderful, thank you. Laura, are you able to separate us out with our facilitators into breakout rooms? For anybody who would like to join us, we are going to continue to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, we have a few questions that we've developed with facilitators to kind of talk about um, a little, just a little bit more about that civil rights legacy and Pearl Buck. If you'd like to join us, um, please stay on, stay on the Zoom call, but we understand if you have to go. Um, everyone will be randomly assigned to one of our facilitators. I will be in a room. Um, Scott um, and Laura, I believe, will also be in rooms, possibly jumping around to speak to people. So we would love to have you if you are, if you are able to stay with us tonight. Yes, I, I'm setting those up now. Um, we, uh, like VJ said, we'll have a, uh, about 15, 20 minutes of um, just open discussion. So it'll enable you all to ask each other questions and talk about some of the issues. Um, and also uh, we'll be sharing some additional information um, via email after this. So uh, you'll be able to reach out to us to get um, additional information as well. So um, I will be putting you into breakout rooms. And uh, if you have any issues, just stay online. You'll, you'll automatically go there. But if, if you have any issues, just um, stay there. and we'll, we'll get you into one. So um, thank you all. And let's see, we'll leave you in there for about 20 minutes. And uh, so we will send you off. So if you um, are here, do you, um, did you get a message to tell you to click into a room?
Uh, yes, I did. I'm going to have to leave though now, but thanks okay. very much. Oh, thank you so much for joining. Susan, are you having uh, problems trying to get into the room? There you go. Nope, I think you're muted, Susan. There, how about now, join? And something like that, but if you understand something that's known in the community that's not talked about, the fact that he talked about it in the newspaper, it's just a measure of how she had an impact on people that was positive. So that's just one example of the stuff I kind of dug up, just doing like a lot of newspaper research. I sent a, a brief note. This is Dale Yoder. Yes. Here. I read your book three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to express my appreciation for you adding a kind of information and details that confirms what we know Pearl Buck was a woman before her time. Uh, in a lot of ways. She and she uh, really was up on everything. Yeah, I don't know what. Her, how she, I just don't know how she wrote all that stuff, the energy level, and just, she was a person who had a lot of irons in the fire. You could just tell that she was constantly working on stuff. I remember having a conversation with her one day when she really surprised me because not only was she someone concerned about civil rights and women's rights, oh, yeah. she, she knew about baseball. <laughs> We had, a, we had a conversation about the about the Philadelphia Phillies. That wasn't 1964, was it? It was before that. Uh, this was just before that. No, oh. it was like probably 62, but it was it was a it was a real shock to me that she would have such immediate knowledge. I mean, we were sitting by her her swimming pool. And, and all of a sudden, she's pulling out all these details of, of uh, sporting heroes. But of course, it led to her position that women should be given the same kinds of rights for athletic participation and, and whatnot. And so yeah. it, it all fits together if you really look at it. Did she ever make any other public statements or writings about women's rights. This is Bill Irwin. I live in Doylestown. Yeah, she, she definitely did. She did a <clears throat> essay or editorial on one of those two books about the Equal Rights Amendment. Oh, and, when was that? 
It was in the forties. It's I think I think it's in the blue book. Yes, she did talk about that. So I can uh that's out there definitely. And she was uh involved in that during the war, the uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, where they had racial quotas on people from China. So the irony is she lobbied for that to end. And the first person who was readmitted to the country was her first husband remarried and had a child. And that child was the first person to come back from China in the late forties. But yeah, she was, uh, it's, she, she would get into different themes like that. She was always very China centric and, but she would work China into everything to a certain extent, but she was, you know, that was one of her topics was the Equal Rights Amendment which I think had been proposed back in the 1920s in some form. Dale Yoder's daughter, I have a quick question. You um, said something about Ed Sullivan and I wondered if she had a verbal debate or a written debate with him. I was no, it was, uh, the New York Times had this series of letters going when she did the editorial and then there are people who agree with her and Ed Sullivan stuck up for uh, the Times but I think he was the Broadway Review columnist for the New York World or some other paper at that point. No, I, I don't think he was a significant figure at that point. And she did, didn't really get involved in the follow-up debate publicly. Rarely did she do that. She did it with the Dorothy Thompson thing, which is kind of unusual. But that was a whole... She was good friends with Sinclair Lewis, her second husband. And at that point, I think they had been divorced and maybe she and Dorothy weren't on good terms. <laughs> So she knew better than to follow up sometimes. Uh, she picked her time to do it. I, I would not want to get a letter from her. <laughs> or get criticized in public, but she built art. She built very, these really logical polemic arguments, and you know, probably something you don't want to get involved with. I also, um, sorry to uh, ask another one, but because I only am such so far removed from dad being a young man meeting Pearl Buck, I'm curious to ask my dad if he remembers Pearl Buck in any other light than the one he knew her as, as the Welcome House mom. If he knew her, of her, um, these civil rights and things. So I just am curious for my dad to answer that. If, he, if you had a sense as a young man, Poppy, of her civil rights, did you know that when you were in your 15 and meeting her? I'm not sure what you're asking. Oh, Mitch, I can't ask you that. It's all right. Okay, it's okay. Sorry about that. I, I'll ask him later. I'll ask him. <laughs> My hearing's not so hot these right. days. <laughs> no. Yeah. Mitch, it's on. I pushed it. It's not on me. Just so you know. Oh, yeah. So did we have any other questions we had put about discussing or did we want to just have an open conversation? Well, I just want to thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, it was really informative and enlightening. And at the same time, <clears throat> a little uh, disconcerting that so little is known about her work in civil rights and her words. I mean, of course, everybody knows who Pearl Buck, the author, was, but as an activist, no. And, and that almost, at least in my world, I, I didn't know that she took such bold uh, stands way ahead of her time. And to me, that is almost a, um, I'm looking for a word here, double whammy for lack of anything better that while she would speak out on civil rights, including women's rights, she was ignored um, by the mainstream. Maybe, maybe certain segments of society and academia know about this, but I read the article in this morning's Intelligencer. That's why I signed mm -hmm. up tonight. That's how I found out about it. And the article itself was, that was enlightening to me that, uh, and I, I feel badly that nobody, well, few people, know her in the way you have portrayed. It's interesting, her writings when she wrote for, say, Elmer Carter, the editor of the uh, Opportunity magazine for the National Urban League. They're real interesting 
just from a writing standpoint, journalistic standpoint, but she's making these really compelling arguments about social issues. But you have to realize at the time she's doing that, she's won the Pulitzer Prize. She won the Howes Medal, I think in 1935, which was probably a, was a higher honor than the Pulitzer. I was only awarded every five years and she was only the third person to, to have that. And you know, she's the Nobel Prize winner. And she's doing this stuff for an audience that is kind of like this disenfranchised audience. Those things I think are important. The letter to the New York Times I think is important for a lot of reasons. And she would pick her moments to do things like that. But definitely, I think she understood the limits of what she could do in the 30s. And it's, it's interesting how she approached going with a broader message right before like Pearl Harbor. If you think about that, you know, the amount of patriotism after the attack and everything, and she's out there saying this is good, but we need to make sure that we have equality as part of the war. And that is an interesting decision on her part because she didn't have to do that, but she did it anyway. Um, can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh I'm sorry, I'm, I'm another daughter. My dad has three daughters. And I, I, I did wanna to say to you that sadly, you had said um, that everybody knows Pearl S. Buck. And sadly, I have to tell you that not everybody does know Pearl S. Buck. And I, I think that is a tragedy. I think it's a tragedy that I'm 60 years old and that I've been through school, I've been through college and I am so proud of my my ancestry. I'm so proud of my Viola and Poppy who who were part of Welcome House and on and on it goes. And that's a big part of what I talk about in my life. And uh, when I talk about Pearl S. Buck, I can't tell you how many students who I've worked with over the years. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? So I, I, I don't know, there, there needs to be something different in the school systems where we're not always learning about, I'm sorry, you're a man, but you are a man. And over the years, sometimes it's, it's, it's the, the men that we, we read about and learn about and the male activists, but there have been so many female heroes too. We need to learn more about the females too. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that needs to change, I think. Yeah, I, think, I agree. And, yeah, and that's, absolutely. That's, the, that's the double whammy I was talking about. And maybe when I made the statement, everybody knows who Pearl Buck is. Uh, I was speaking from my own personal experience because uh, I, um, my, uh, my family lived in Shanghai, China from 1946 okay. until the end of 1948, right before mm -hmm. the communist takeover and so and I was a little child and my mother had all of Pearl Buck's books all of them and she talked about Pearl Buck right. and her writings because as you say they were so China-centric I, right. I I probably shouldn't say she had all of them she had a lot <laughs> of them and they all <laughs> pertain to China I, I yeah. I'm, I'm sorry for the exaggeration but yeah so I grew up I didn't learn about her in school. So I do have to agree with what was just said. Yeah, the school was deficient, but I also uh, grew up in a public school system, a very, very good public school system in Minnesota that I never heard about civil rights or Jim Crow or Tulsa, Oklahoma or any of that stuff. I grew up in a completely white world that first black person I met or any minority was when I joined the Marine Corps. Um, so maybe I'm not maybe, but I am, I have a limit. I grew up with a limited worldview, but that has since changed, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Understood. I well, agree with you. Very, very well said. Yeah. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. I'm the deputy executive officer for Pro Less Buck International. So um, I just wanted to say, you know, I've had the opportunity to visit all of our country offices and the name Pearl Buck in Asia, all over Asia is well known. It's unbelievable that when you come back here, people don't know who she is. It's really shocking. Um, it is. And, and one of the other comments I want to make is about the Nobel. You know, it's interesting, even if you look at some of the pictures from the Nobel award, 
you have to remember that was even given to her at a time when women weren't winning those kinds of things. There were there was beliefs within other authors that that shouldn't have gone to her. Yes, they were very sexist. <laughs> Very, and and very Jerry, you know, I, I guess there's a, there's a phrase quote from Robert Frost where he said, "Well, if she can win it, anybody can win it." Mm-hmm. So of course, then they gave it to him, you know. <laughs> but right. but there, her there's... style was was different, and yeah. it wasn't because of her style; it's because of the impact she had on cultural understanding. Mm-hmm. And if you think about what was going on in the world in 1938, where there's a lot of concern about the Japanese invasion, China, and the war. I mean, the Nobel Committee was making a statement about her cultural impact beyond as part of literature that didn't jive with the people like I think Dreiser was not happy and there there were a lot of men who were not happy that she got that award but that's not what the committee was looking at there's a really good picture of her at the award ceremony with John and Jackie Kennedy and Frost I believe is sitting next to them he does not look happy (laughs) he does not look like a very happy man no, no I don't think so. my, my other comment would be it's not just women's rights and civil rights she also brought out the needs of children with disabilities oh that she, was huge the article in the ladies yeah. home journal there is a uh, there's a book called the child that never grew that i highly recommend to everyone it's not a long book but it's amazing to me what she brought forth at a time when these people were not talked about and the parents were going through pretty much hell on their own and she spoke about her process and how how she figured out what was going on it was it's really a an amazing book to read particularly if you have anyone in your family with a mm-hmm. disability and the irony is if you look at the and newspaper she stories she came the divine one home for children like yes mm-hmm. right where carol was yes absolutely mm-hmm. and that's why one of the reasons she came back to the u.s was you know she needed her in a better system but yeah, that, that's really important. And what I found out reading the newspapers is she was getting ready to do the PR tour for that. And then the thing happened with the Washington DC school district. Then she got the flu. So she still did the speaking tour with the flu and she would not talk about the Washington DC school thing because it was distracting her from doing the, the promotion for the book. And the only people she really talked to was the, the news her the paper in Percocy she would talk to about it. So can I be the third daughter that says something? Hi, Scott. <laughs> Welcome. So I'm, I'm currently a teacher. I teach sixth grade world cultures. And today in chapel, it's a virtual chapel we had because of COVID, but we learned a lot about Desmond Tutu and some of the good things that our chaplain shared. It was it was very interesting and motivating. And now I want to bring you know Pearl Buck to his attention. We're doing a lot right now, obviously, on civil rights, but I I like what my sister said, and I, I feel the, very motivated now the need to, to bring this forward and to you know, maybe make a little bit of a difference in a, in a school community. And I know that's what you do with Pearl Buck International already, right? You have school groups all the time, but it's... And you well, do it. not so much since COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're trying hard to get back into that, yeah. yes. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I think that's hearing what's been said. I, I, I feel that submission we can all mm-hmm. take in our own way, whatever Laurie loves to do, Facebook and social media, and I'll try to put some in the in the schoolwork. So, Scott, thanks for motivating me. I'm fired up to go back to my kids tomorrow. Yeah, and yeah, she's a wonderful. great reason. I, I think what's good about her is she's in this unique point in time because she grew up in China, went to the U.S. She has these, these two cultural perspectives. And how do you deal with that? you know, that cultural shock and all of a sudden you're one of the most famous people of the country. But it's at the time when, you know, during the 1930s, it is Jim Crow. Uh, the anti-lynching law thing was a big deal back then, the whole debate about that and the power of what was called the Solid South and the Democratic Party. And there's a lot of things going on that you would not probably learn about normally in like a high school history class. Well, and don't forget, we have a pretty large archive. If you need any information, you contact VJ because she can find just about anything you want in that archive. It it is, and it's interesting. I'm finding stuff. There's so much stuff digitized online. There's just a lot out there on her. There's just so much information. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. If your rooms were like our room, we were still continuing that conversation. <laughs> we could probably talk for another hour. <laughs> so, 
All right, is everybody everybody back? Yeah. All right. Do we have any kind of late breaking questions um, that we can put in the chat that we can ask Scott before we go? Um, we've got a, just a little bit more time um, in case we do have any more questions. I know from, from my room and it sounds like the other rooms as well, we had a lot of really lovely. I have a question. Are you gonna do this again? I think this is great. I, I, I'd like to do it again. I had to put my other history projects on hold, you know, but I think I'd have this. I did do a lot of research and kind of got obsessed with the newspaper coverage. Yeah, I'd like to do it, maybe have a little more background information to share. Yeah, we, we would welcome to uh, host it again and, and, and hopefully uh, possibly do uh, something in person where we could have even larger group um, discussions. So yes, please. Uh, Share any types of ideas that we have that we can that that can Absolutely. be shared. We've got a couple of fantastic questions. So, Scott, is there a place where all of your articles, your information, is in one spot that can be accessed by the public and our friends in the audience? I do have a Percocy history blog, and I, I put some of it up there, but not everything in the the presentation. But what I can do is put up the the video recording in there, and maybe put some more detail in. I'll see if I can link to... It's called Preserving Percocy. And it's actually my, my other project in town is to try and get the borough and the National Register of Historic Places. So I have a lot of stuff about Percocy in there in general. And it's interesting, she always signed her name, you know, Pearl Buck, Pearl Osbuck, Percocy, Pennsylvania. Oh. And, but she never really, well, lived in Percocy proper, but she, she certainly was a figure in town. She also had a habit of popping up at the Lions Club and speaking and the high school especially she would pop into like the like classes and do things like that scott if you could post funny. that address for the blog i'm sending out a survey afterwards i can make sure the link to it is on the survey form i can do that yeah wonderful what a treat to have her just show up at the school to talk <laughs> well yeah you get the, the pulitzer prize winner in your, right. your your lit class i mean i and she spoke at the 1957 uh, penridge graduation and that speech is in the old newspapers. It's pretty interesting. Scott, is there a way that we can connect with you later and communicate? Sure. Um, I'm actually up in Vermont and as a little hobby or whatever, trying to dig up more information about Pearl Buck's um, life up here and um, just encouraging people to look more into her history and what she did up here. That I don't know a lot about. <laughs> I really constantly, you could, can we talk to Dale about that? But uh, I really concentrated before Welcome House. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, I, I'd be happy to uh, maybe do a follow-up later tomorrow or, or next week. And we can talk about doing something like this, but maybe some more support material. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just knew that she what she had like three cabins up there or something, and then she moved up there in the sixties at some point. She had a couple different properties. And there are a couple of people I see in this audience that know a fair amount. No, I was much more focused on uh, her activities in Percocy. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is, if she popped up in Percocy, it was in the newspaper, you know. I, I know, I guess she would shop in town and do th different things like that, but she was very uh, vested in the local community, spoke at a lot of schools, a lot of events, and she liked living here. And she was, uh, I think she appreciated the community. And there, there are definitely stories of how she felt accepted by the community around here. I mean, Welcome House is a great example of that. And the story that, I think it's in Dale's book, but I have it. She wrote, did a letter in 1966 that was in a Penridge uh, promotional thing about the, how she met with the leaders of Hilltown in Dublin to ask for acceptance for the kids. And they said, we'd be honored to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, another thing that's kind of lost in that story, you know. 
Scott, do you also have a location, and this might also be preservingperkacy.com, which a link is now in the chat to that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anywhere else that you um, put your information, um, perhaps even if it's not specific to, to Pearl S. Buck, but um, your kind of your information about Percocet history? Are there any on there. places Definitely. to follow you? Yeah. And what, what I'll do is I'll probably put a copy up of the editorial from today on there and some other stuff and kind of keep that current. So before we start to, to kind of wrap up and, and move towards the very end of our presentation, um, do we have any last um, minute kinds of questions? Um, if not, um, we we will we will move on, but just in case there's anything late breaking in the chat room. It looks like we're good. All right. Well, in that case, um, oh, we do have some questions about whether or not the presentation will be available, um, and and the PowerPoint. Um, Laura, are you able to speak to that a little bit? Um, we are recording it, and we'll um we'll be able to um work on getting that available to everybody. Um, we'll be reaching out to you after this event. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, thank you all everyone so much for joining us tonight. The, the response has been really lovely. So many people have, have shown up and if the other breakout rooms were anything like mine, um, just absolutely wonderful to-, yeah, to Ours was very active, time. yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much, Scott, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Laura, for putting- Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for sharing thank your you. night with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, did you want to wait? Mm -mm. I'm good. Mm -hmm.